Our lessons this morning come from the Christian scriptures, the first from the epistles, the letter of Paul to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 11 to 20. Hear these words from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Next, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 33 to 43. Hear these words from Eugene Peterson's The Message. When they got to the place called Skull Hill, they crucified Jesus, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Dividing up his clothes, they threw dice for them. The people stood there staring at Jesus, and the ringleaders made faces taunting. He saved others. Let's see him save himself. The Messiah of God? Ha! The Chosen? Ha! The soldiers also came up and poked fun at him, making a game of it. They toasted him with sour wine. So you're the king of the Jews. Save yourself. Printed over him was a sign. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging alongside cursed him. Some Messiah you are. Save yourself. Save us. But the other one made him shut up. Have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. He said, don't worry, I will. Today you will join me in paradise. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Will you please pray with me? Oh God, come to us in the quietness of this very moment. Center our hearts and our minds on you and you alone. Open us to the power and to the presence of your Holy Spirit and remind us that your love, mercy, and grace come to us unasked for and free. Amen. The late Phyllis Tickle was an American author and lecturer whose work focused on spirituality and religious issues. She is most known for her work as the founding editor of the religion department at Publishers Weekly before she became a popular writer. 
I met Dr. Tickle some years ago when she was the commencement speaker at one of the Bangor Theological Seminary's graduation. It wasn't my graduation, uh, but rather one that I had attended. It's interesting, while I, I neither recall the message nor I can't even remember the speaker from my own graduation, um, I do remember the words from Phyllis Tickle at this graduation. Tickle spoke about the Roman god Janus. In ancient religion and myth, Janus was the god of beginnings and endings. And Janus is usually depicted in art as having a, a double-faced head looking in opposite directions. Now, Tickle went on to talk about uh, this moment in time, the, the seminary commencement, in which the graduates' work, on the one hand, had ended, yet, on the other hand, their work was just getting started. The graduation moment was one where the, the student looked back at what they had accomplished over the course of three or more years of graduate work, as well as looking forward to what they might encounter in their ministry ahead. Janus represented this gateway of looking back as well as into the future. So I've been thinking about Janus this past week as I reflected on today's service. You see, because today is the last Sunday in the Christian calendar. Next week, we begin anew with the first Sunday of Advent. And we start looking forward to the coming of Christ. Today, in the church calendar, is named Christ the King, or Reign of Christ Sunday, the last Sunday in this three-year revised common lectionary cycle. So we are ending what we refer to as Year C, and we will begin anew with Year A next week. So we have spent this past year looking at the, the life and ministry of Jesus through the eyes of the Gospel of Luke. We have listened to Jesus preach and teach. We have watched him heal the sick, cleanse lepers, share a meal with tax collectors and sinners, and we've seen him cast out demons. And we have arrived at the end, and on this graduation day, at this moment in time, we sum up all that we have learned and know about Jesus. Christ the King, or Reign of Christ Sunday, was introduced to the church. So this isn't like going back 2,000 years. This was introduced to the church as a festival. It was introduced by Pope Pius XI in 1925. And you think, well, why was that created? Well, at the time of its creation, you have to remember that there were fascist dictators rising to power in Europe. So one commentator writes, the institution of this feast was therefore almost an act of defiance from the church against all those who at the time were seeking to absolutize their own political ideologies, insisting boldly that no earthly power, no particular political system or military dictatorship is ever absolute. Rather, only God is eternal and only the kingdom of God is an absolute value which never fails. And so, as a way of summing up the ministry of Jesus at the end of the Christian year, the church crowns Jesus king, which is to say that in what we have seen and heard in these last 12 months, we have come to believe what we find, what we read in the Christian scriptures where it boldly affirms 
Jesus really is King of kings and Lord of lords. So it seems rather odd that the text selected for Christ the King Sunday is the one from Luke 23, where Jesus doesn't look like a king at all. Luke says that Jesus and a couple of convicted criminals were crucified just outside of the city of Jerusalem in a place called the Skull. Crucifixion was the way the Roman government dealt with troublemakers, flexing its power, which also served as a deterrent don't mess with Rome or you'll be killed in the same manner. Luke says that they crucified Jesus along with the two others, one on his left and one on his right. And someone, more likely one of the soldiers, hung a sign over his head that read, this is the king of the Jews. Now, it was customary in those days to to place a sign above the head of the one being crucified that stated the charge for which they had been condemned to death. On either side of Jesus were men who were killed because of crimes that they had committed. I'm guessing that those signs said something like a murderer or a thief. Now, I don't know what crimes were punishable by death in those days, but... The crime with which Jesus was charged was the crime of insurrection. In the vast Roman Empire, ruled by Caesar Tiberius at the time, there could be only one king. So when the religious authorities brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate, asking him to deal with this troublemaker, They said that he was calling himself a king, and that that couldn't be. So the sign over his head, this is the king of the Jews, was there to tell anyone who might be looking on, this is what the Roman Empire does to people who try to make themselves a king. There can be no king but Caesar. What is the church wanting us to know on this last day of the Christian calendar before we begin our Advent preparations next week for the birth of the Christ into our world? One commentator asked, could it be that someone wants us to remember that normally kings die with royal dignity and with great monuments erected in their honor, but that Jesus was left to die hanging on the cross in the dump outside of the town between two thieves. Could it be that someone wants us to know that Jesus reigns beside us and not over us, and that he suffered the same consequences that you and I would have suffered if we had dared to carry the same message of total inclusivity love into the world where boundaries and borders were exalted. What kind of king is Jesus anyway? The Jesus we have been following is far different than Caesar. You see, Caesar was all about power and control, acting from a place of being self-serving rather than serving others. So in this Janus moment, as we look back at the stories we have heard about Jesus this past year, we see that Jesus was always turning things upside down, calling us to live in community where we pray for one another, where we respond 
in generosity and grace to all, where we are welcoming to all, offering a cup of water to those who in, are in need. You'll recall that the early followers of Jesus were called followers of the way, meaning to be on the way with Jesus. As we turn from looking back and now face the future, we see a faith that is ongoing. By being part of a community of faith, by being on a faith journey, we seek God's truth for our lives, seeking not power. We look to receive insight, understand God's great mystery, and get a glimpse of a communal vision as a people of faith who walk together humbly with our God. Now, the epistle reading is purported to be written by Paul to the Colossians. And Paul prays that believers would be strong in faith and give thanks to God, in whom they now have an inheritance of, or inheritance in the light. The metaphor of light and shadow um, have been rescued from the shadows through Jesus Christ, in whose reign they now belong. Now Paul goes on to declare that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Everything on earth and in heaven, visible and invisible, was created through Christ, and Christ is first in everything. Christ is the head of the church and in whom God was well pleased to dwell, the one who reconciled all things and made peace through his death on the cross. What kind of king is Jesus? The one who waves a, a scepter from on high, acting in a dominating, manipulative manner? or who imposes will by force or violence, controlling from above? No. You see, our king stands beside us, walks with us as we face the troubles of our day. One commentator writes, Jesus wasn't superhuman. Jesus was superbly human in that he loved to the fullest extent he loved as god loves the distinctive mark of god's power therefore that is in work through the the weaknesses of human beings is service service which one commentator describes as the self-giving love which dwells with the poor and not the rich, with the sinful and not the righteous, with the weak and not the strong, with the dying and not those full of life. In our gospel text, the religious authorities, the the soldiers, and even the thief all say to Jesus, if you are king, then save yourself. But Jesus turned out to be the kind of king who cared more about saving others than saving himself. And so he hung on that cross. Now, I don't know what kind of king you want. But that sounds like the kind of king I think that we need. In our Janus moment, may our eyes be opened to seeing that different kind of king. The same God we will see come as a humble infant in a manger in a new liturgical year as we begin Advent next week. 
come join this forward-looking movement as we embark on a journey of faith. Amen.